Alrighty guys, Ted here for round 5 of the Ted Woolsey Uncensored Hack. So everything is going well. Oh god, not again, come on. There we go. <laughs> I'm gonna say. So yeah, I managed to uh, find a save point and all that good stuff. In fact, the video, strangely enough, worked perfectly fine the moment I stopped recording. So yeah, that's uh, that's a bit sketchy. All right, so quick question for you guys. What do you feel could be changed about Final Fantasy VI's battle mechanics outside of the difficulty that would improve it? You may use comparisons from other series if you'd like to. Personally, what I would like is for a less lesser emphasis on magic in particular. And I understand from a story-based perspective, it makes sense. However, it's too easy to break the game by teaching people spells via Magicite. There's just not enough emphasis on the secondary functions, the utilitary functions, or auxiliary functions, my apologies, of the characters like Steel and Runic and so on and so forth to really be all that effective. Even Edgar's tools, as potent as they are, are going to be overshadowed by magic. <laughs> Thief knife, I love it. Alright, another question for you guys. Assuming a 3D remake was in the works, what style of remake would you like it to be? Would you like it to be in the vein of FF7's remake, or would you like it to be more like FF4DS's remake, etc.? And what would you change about it? I don't really have any ideas for changes, but one thing I would certainly like to see remake-wise is something along the lines of the FF4DS version. Because I don't know how I'll be able to handle full 3D graphics. I don't. I don't think it's necessary, honestly. So yeah, bringing Edgar and Sap in here is a must. There's. There's no contest. No, no, I'm going the wrong way. Yep, I'm going the wrong way. I know where I'm going. Now, as you can see here, Sabin is a very emotive and very impulsive person. He's 
for better or worse, simply unable to see the bigger picture and understand that these matters that are being discussed are important. He's just simply not suited for the role of a king who has to look out for others in the degree that a king does. And that's a big part of why he decided to temper himself and his emotions as a monk. Now, he's still very impulsive, still very emotive, because that is who Savin is as a person. But he has been able to manage that to a degree through very fierce physical and mental training. Now, the Empire poisoned their father, the, the former king. We don't really know why or who it was done by. Maybe it was Kefka. <laughs> if I had to speculate... I honestly don't know. I can't think of any direct reason why they would have would poison him. Figaro is our allies of the Empire at some point in time, so... If anyone understands, let me know. what Sabin wants. He wants dignity and he wants his freedom. He doesn't want to be bound by these rules. Edgar wants it too, but he, they can't both have it. One of them has to stay. So Edgar says, okay, I'm not simply going to take over the reins. I'm going to give the illusion of choice, the illusion of freedom, to Sabin. And let, quote-unquote, fate decide. But that's not quite how it works. As we later find out, the, the coin was two-sided. Edgar cheated. And the reason he did this was because he understood that Sabin not only wanted the freedom more than Edgar did, but he was simply less capable of taking over as king. So he gave his brother the freedom that he longed for because he cared about him that much. He took on the burden of responsibility so that his brother wouldn't have to. This is a pretty huge step for their character arcs, respectively. It doesn't quite completely wrap everything up. In fact, that doesn't really happen until... I would say, arguably, the very last part of the game, the closing credits, where Sabin further elaborates on why he decided to leave. <laughs> ah, King Edgar! Oh, fuck! go.
Look at this, they cross a mountain. They go underground past a mountain. They travel like half the continent. go um i don't know how i'm gonna react it's never been pleasant so there's a good chance that in a moment i'm gonna actually yeah i'm gonna mute my microphone for the next several minutes while these sequences play out wait until i'm calm and then i'll talk about them in detail because it would be an injustice to the game and to the character to not do so but it would be an injustice to the viewers if if i weren't <laughs> If, if, if I were to just leave the microphone as is, so I will see you guys in a few minutes.
Alrighty guys, so I'm back. <clears throat> God damn, can we get to a place where there's less music to distract me? Oh, I forgot Shadow was here. Okay. So... The reason I had to mute the microphone was because I couldn't... There was no way I could describe the situation that was happening without having a severe emotional reaction. And the reason why... The reason why that scene hits me so emotionally is because I have a personal stake within it. It's, it's simply too easy to imagine myself as Locke and imagine my fiance, who I love more than anything in the entire world, as Rachel. And I know what it would feel like to, to be burdened with the guilt of causing something like that to happen to her. And to have that same person not even know who you are anymore, you lose everything. It's... Locke was an adventurer, okay? He took Rachel to all sorts of places to find all sorts of treasures, and it was for that very same reason that caused her to collapse. And what makes this so difficult is the fact that Locke was the one who was going to fall through that bridge, and Rachel selflessly, or selfishly, however you want to interpret it, saved him, very much like Anna did to Edward in FF4, and she did this because she loved him more than she loved herself, and that drove an, an immense amount of guilt within Locke because he would want the opposite. He would have wanted Rachel to let him fall because he cares more about her than himself, and it, it pains me so much because that's how I would feel in that situation, and I know that the, my other half, my better half, that is how she would feel about that situation. That is what she would do. She would save me in a heartbeat because she loves me more than she loves herself. And Locke has been carrying this burden, this gift, this guilt around with him. And he preserved her with some weird fucking herbs. I don't even want to go into that. Because he heard rumors of the Phoenix Magicite. Now he doesn't know what Magicite is at this point. He just has heard about the Phoenix and that is why he hasn't done anything actively to do to, to find it, because he doesn't have any clues. He doesn't even know if it exists. It is not until later where he interacts with Magicite that he puts two and two together and realizes this Phoenix thing might be a Magicite and it might actually exist. It might actually do what I need it to do. And when he revives her, she tells him to let go of the guilt and to move on with his life and find happiness and I know that, that that's what she would tell me and that's 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 what I would tell her this scene I was just playing the game the first time around having a cigarette while playing and I I, I broke down into uncontrollable tears I can't even listen to the song without having an emotional attack basically an NPC we never even heard about until just now <laughs> generated a stronger emotional response than Aerith's death and Zack's death combined because I had a personal stake within it. And this is... I like Locke for a number of reasons, but this is why he's my favorite character, him or Setzer. But this is why he's one of my favorite characters in the game and in all Final Fantasy in general because I understand. And kid, stop following me around. talking about Terra, obviously. And this is why, this is why he joined the Returners. He lost everything. He was, he was suicidal. He didn't care anymore. Okay, let's talk to Shadow.
Hey, buddy. Okay, let's grab some stuff. Get out of my face. about that second one. He's dead? What? Oh, he was poisoned and I didn't know it. <laughs> okay. Guess I need to stop it in real quick. So I found out what the skipping was, it was just me running out of uh, memory space because these videos save in ADI and I have to re-render them and all this other bullshit before I can upload them. So it, it takes a, a, a huge toll on my computer. So I had to delete a few things. So there should be significantly less um, skipping from here on out. Optimum doesn't do too well, but it's a nice start. It's If you're too lazy to go through every single detail, it's a nice way to um, kind of bypass it just a little bit. <clears throat> Alright, let's leave this place. Next up, we're heading to... We should be heading to Zozo. Which isn't this way. That's alright, we don't need to be there anytime soon. Alright, another question for you guys. Within Final Fantasy, what moments gave you the highest amount of feel, or feels? What moment just hit you beyond your, your comprehension, if any? I shouldn't have to explain mine. I can't wait to get to Zozo. There's so much to talk about in Zozo. But right now we're heading to Gidor. Can't do anything to Opera House right now. Of 
part of the reason I'm heading to Jador is because there's some stuff I can get from there, and plus I can ride a Chocobo. It should make things easier. Oh, damn it. I cannot wait till we get the airship because it is the first moment in the game in which you are given an immense amount of freedom. And all things considered, this game throws you for a loop. Oh god damn it, be confused, more like be dead. <laughs> the game starts off actually incredibly linear, all things considered, one of the more linear games in the series. But once you get the airship, it's it becomes arguably the least linear in the game in the series. Because of the simple fact that you can go literally anywhere, anywhere whatsoever. In Final Fantasy VII, for example, there were a number of places you couldn't get to with an airship where you needed a, ch a certain type of chocobo. And even if it was a place you could reach via airship, you still had to park it in a reasonably distant spot and then walk there, which wasn't very far, but still. I mean... Here, you can any place that you can fly over, with the exception of the ocean, of course, you can land there. Period. About the only landmass you can't actually land on are mountains, and there's nothing in the mountains to land on to go to, so what's the point? You know what I would really love to see? An arranged version of this soundtrack on the level of FF4s, because I think a p big part of the reason why FF4 has arguably my favorite soundtrack in the series is specifically because it's arranged. It really dramatically improves the quality. I'm really starting to wish I had the Genji Glove. And I had a chance to get it too back with Bannon, and I fucking failed. Uh, there's not much to get here. Don't need to be here yet. Oh! Maybe I'll be in luck. No. I doubt there's anything in here that I'll need. Not really. Alright, let's go get a chocobo. Chocobo. 
the first time I got this chocobo, I went all the way down south to the opera house only for them to tell me, hey, you have no business here. <laughs> and I'm like, are you kidding me? I have to walk that stretch all the way back up? I'm sure I'm not alone in that. Zozo is an interesting place. It is a run-down town pretty much ran by thieves. There's so much history with this town, it's just amazing. First off, if you haven't noticed, well there you go, there are random encounters everywhere because there are just literally monsters and thieves just around, because why not? And they're tough, like this bastard right here is tough. Zozo is interesting because it's one of the few towns, I think it's really the only town in the entire game that does not change at all during the World of Ruin. Because the Zozo citizens are just like, World of Ruin? Kefka? Who's that? A pop star? End of the world? Pfft, who cares? Zozo's always been in ruin. <laughs> Great people here. Yeah, sure. Totally. Now, this place is home to Rama. And I have to wonder why Rama chose this place to hide out from the Empire. And when you think about it, it makes perfect sense. Okay? The Empire is not going to come here unless they have at least reasonable certainty that there's an Esper. And these enemies, as you can see, <laughs> these thieves are no joke. They're not going to waste soldiers in, in good manpower and hours over a rumor. Now, the Empire would tear this city to pieces if they truly wanted to, but it wouldn't be easy. So when you really think about it, it's, it's no wonder... I know I'm not going the right way. So when you think about it, it's no wonder that Rama chose this place to stay at. Just fucking die, you scumbag. Great. <laughs> so they find Terra. I shouldn't even have to explain why this song is being played right now. I really don't. I really like this version of Rama because there's a, an immense amount of characterization within him compared to his other incarnations. Oh, I don't know, maybe because there's a greedy fucking empire? It did, until the War of the Magi.
He fled because he was afraid. But he hates that fact. He hates that he ran away and refused to save his friends. And so... Sure. And so is Celeste. Sid is in charge of the Magic Re Magitech Research Facility. It is Sid's sole purpose to drain the power from espers and use them in a variety of ways, like creating Magitech Knights, Magitech Units, etc. And Sid has a connection with, with... I mean, Sid. Celeste has a personal connection with Sid. Sid is basically the closest thing to a father she's ever had. So I think she would know. That was Rama's issue. Like a coward, I escaped leaving the others there. It'll be the end of them. And he despises that fact. So he decides that he'll turn himself into Magicite as his way of redeeming himself and saving the others. You have to wonder why Rama ever bothered to keep these Magicite around. I believe, personally, that Rama was waiting for this moment, that he knew at some point or another that human beings would have a reason to coexist with the Espers and try to fight the Empire. And it's very likely that Rama actually knew Madeline and Madonna Or Madeline, depending on the version. I believe this version is Madeline. So he probably knew that it was certainly possible for them to coexist in the modern day. So when an Esper turns into Magicite, they're willingly committing suicide. This is the point in the game when so much happens. The threat just amplifies dramatically. Kate Sith. Kirin. I love Kirin. Siren. Alright, so... Ooh, Rock is dead, so I kind of can't equip him with anything right now. I'll do that in a moment. I should be able to kind of exit... Yep, that's what I thought. This is the first point in the game where we get a firm grasp on what the Empire's goal is.
Not from you, buddy. <laughs> Not from you. Actually, we're going to bring Edgar and kind of want to bring Gao. No, nah, not really. Sabin's coming with us. Go back to Narsh, buddy. Oh hell no, if I die here, I'm gonna be fucking furious. So first we're gonna save, and then I'm going to briefly talk about Magicite. The Magicite is a wonderful tool. Magicite and Relics in a lot of ways were sort of what laid the groundwork for Materia in, in, in Final Fantasy VII. Magicite is the sole way to learn magic outside of Celeste and Terra, and I suppose Strago and Realm and Gao use pseudo magic to learn magic in the game. Magicite teaches you the individual spells here. And every time you complete a battle, provided you can get magic points for that, you get a certain number of them that change throughout, you know, the game. And that number is then multiplied by your learn rate, as you can see, to determine your overall skill progress of learning that spell. And once you do so, you learn that individual spell. Now, this isn't a direct example, this is just an idea so you can get the point. Thunder times 10, okay, on Rama. You may pick up another Magicite in the future where the Thunder learn rate is times 20, so it's more optimal to use that Magicite. And every time you level up, bam, you get an increase to your stat. So there's a lot of variables to consider. The type of spell you'll learn, how quickly it'll be learned, what stat boost you get. If this game was made difficult, then assigning espers would be that much more of a hectic task. A lot of people pay close attention to the stat ups that you get. I, for the most part, don't, because it's not that required, but it just gives you a nice idea, a nice degree of, uh, customization. Kyrian is really useful. Now, Magicite works almost opposite to that of... Materia. Now in seven, you take the the materia, which is effectively the life force of the planet condensed into a, a solid form and usable to use magic, and you learn magic onto that materia, which can then be passed to other characters to use whatever spells within it. Magicite, on the other hand. You, the Magicite has the spells already within it, and it teaches it to the character. The plus side is that once you remove the Magicite, they still can keep whatever spells they fully completed. The downside to this is that the, the, eventually the Materia itself, Materia, the Magicite itself becomes useless outside of the stat bonuses, so it's like, uh... What's more is that there are times where you're going to be put in situations where you need to give characters Magicite just to make it through the dungeon, and then you're like, okay, so now I have Sabin, my brawler, learning fire. What the hell? So you can't really undo the spells. Whereas in Final Fantasy VII, you had more variants of, of customization and more ways to limit or customize your party however you so choose. So, just something to think about. Alright, so that ends my video for today. Let me make sure... Excuse me, that I double saved. Indeed. Alright, now to edit all these videos together so that they make one cohesive bit of sense. I'll see you guys next time, and hope you guys enjoyed.